Thank you so much for joining the Northwest Church YouTube channel. If you'd like to follow along with the message today, you can check out the notes linked in the description below. Let's jump into the message. Turn your Bibles to chapter 24, uh, Joshua chapter 24, not just random chapter 24, but Joshua chapter 24, as we continue in our series, Telling the Story. You see, um, last week we had the opportunity, and if you were here, you heard some of these stories, but we heard some people are from the church share stories of how God has moved in their life, things God has done, which is awesome stories. But not only that, the significance of those stories, it showed the power of that when we share our story and when we invite others to come experience the same power and the move of God, that they can come and experience life change as a result of that. So our stories carry weight. There's significance to them. I know today it was the stories that my dad told me before bed that I remember today that shapes values and truths and things that I hold true today. Many of you can probably relate, but for a lot of us in culture today and through generations um, in different cultures, it is stories that shapes our values, beliefs, the stories we tell of the things that happen, events. It paints the world around us. And today specifically, we're going to talk about telling the story to the next generation. This is something the Bible talks about often and the importance of it. And not only that, something pastor shares often is that he believes he was called to build a church for the next generation. And here in Northwest, we take that very seriously, that the next generation isn't the church of tomorrow, but the church of the day. That the discipleship and training up starts now. And that from kids to the nursery, from the curriculum and the sermons that we teach, I have a two-year-old that leaves nursery. He loves coming to church and he loves jumping around to praise music. And he may not know what it all means yet, but I know he's excited to worship and to praise. But today, in building that healthy church for the next generation, it ultimately starts with building a healthy church today. By building a healthy church in that we model, because ultimately our prayer is, is that at Northwest we strive that our faith would not die with us, but that the faith we model would be that something other generations see and that they want and that they want to follow of it. So ultimately they experience the grace and the power of God at work in their lives. So today, as we look to scripture, we're going to be picking up in Joshua chapter 24, um, and then we see here, we're going to take one account from the Old Testament, um, and if you've read um, any of the Old Testament, or maybe you're new to this, um, there is a consistent pattern for the nation of Israel um, of disobedience, even though God has chosen them, he's promised the promised land, all these things, but they still have this inclination to false idols, even after miracles and great works and God's wondrous powers all these things, but yet they still choose to be a rebellious people. And this passage in Joshua kind of helps us wrap our mind around that. So pick it up in Joshua. It says, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? And this is a familiar line that many of us probably know and have heard before, but it says, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. This is something you probably have over your mantle or on a little plaque you bought from Hobby Lobby and, you know, put it up there. This is something common. You probably saw it on a Pinterest t-shirt. Um, you know, this is something we declare and proclaim a lot. And it's a great line from an iconic speech to a people as he gives this call to serve God. He's like, you know what? People are rebellious. You're going to do what you want. But as for me and my family, we're going to serve God. But as great as the speech was... As we fast forward a little bit, picking up in Judges, this was the result of that. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. That's impressive. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, meaning passed away, another generation grew up, watch this, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Great speech, great leadership. But still, there was a generation who grew up neither knowing what the Lord had done, nor who the Lord was. A total disbelief, what scripture would call an apostasy, to renounce God, to follow other false gods. 
And it says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods and peoples around them. So again, what this shows here is a pattern of God moving under the leadership of a righteous man like Joshua. But yet there is generation after generation of rebellious people who still chose to turn away from God. And I think it's fair that many of us today have probably had the same thought about generations that follow us. We're like, man, we go to church. Well, we've always been to church. This is what we do. This is who we are. We serve God. And then we look at the world. We follow social media. We see the news. And we look at generations to come. And we're like, do they love God? Do they serve God? How do they think this? How did we end up here? And it's a fair question because according to statistics, Statistics and studies done by Barna, which is a Christian research group, it says that over half of Gen Z expect the worst to happen. So they don't live in a like, state of all expecting God to move. The best is yet to come, but rather that the end is inevitable. More so, two out of the three are either leaving the church or have already left. And probably most frightening, only 3% are reading their Bibles. But while statistics are frightening, I think scripture brings hope and encouragement to what we can do to help model, to help tell the story to the next generation of the goodness and the faithfulness and the wonder and the power of God. Reading Psalm 78, starting in verse two, this is what scripture commands us to do. It says, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should shed its hope anew on God not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. You see, this passage is a call to remember the goodness and the glories, to tell the stories of what God has done, what he's doing, but not just to generations to come. But it says, so each generation should set its hope anew on God. So that's talking about us now, that we should remember his goodness and his faithfulness. And as we recount that and tell those stories, that generation after generation after generation should hear the same and then ultimately come to experience the same power and wonder working of God. So the question is, how do we tell the story to the next generation? Well, if you're taking notes today, number one, we tell of what God did. Number one, what God did. In Psalm 78 verse 4, it says, we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. You see, I encourage you as you go home today and throughout your week, really um, like highlight Psalm 78 and the references, but go home and read that because um, it's a pretty expansive uh, passage there. But it begins to talk about all these wonders and things that God did all throughout the book of Exodus as he led the people out of Egypt, um, all these miracles, things that are just so wild that our mind can't comprehend. We read accounts of, you know, seas being split and people being led through. Um, there's the people being led by a cloud by day to provide shade that followed them as they moved, but then during the night being led by fire to provide light. Rocks being split in the wilderness so that water would pour out like rivers so they had water to drink, but then manna raining down from heaven so that they would have food to eat. And then even the plagues against Egypt, that would eventually allow the people of Israel to be let out. But even after all these accounts, this isn't even all of it. Just under the leadership of Joshua alone, they saw the walls of Jericho fall down and even that he would speak and that the sun would stand still. So the stories were there. The miracles and the wonder and the power of God was all there. They just had to tell about it. So the question is, what story do you have today to tell the next generation? What has God done in your life? How is he moving? How is he working? How have you seen his power? How have you experienced his grace? What is the story today that you have to tell the next generation? You see, as I was studying this week and 
um, reading through Psalm 78. I was just in my office, nothing crazy, lights on in my little corner, I have my Bible open. I'm kind of reading about the history and reading through the whole passage because um, I'm reading each and one of these accounts, and I'm like, wow, man, those miracles, it's awesome. This is the God we serve. And as I begin to read it, I begin to look at it, and I, and I just became to stand in awe of God's grace and his mercy because when you really look at the Old Testament and you really read this psalm, it, all it does, and you really dive into it, it just paints a picture of God's redemptive plan for creation and his grace at work in us and through us and how he set it up then and how it made a way for us now. And as we read that, we see this, and I'm standing there, and I'm just in awe of this. Because you read miracle after miracle, all these things that we could not even fathom, but even after that, the people still rebelled. So as you read through the psalm, it's miracle, rebellion, miracle, disbelief, wonder, provision, disbelief, apostasy, generation after generation. And we see this pattern over and over again. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, man, how gracious and patient is our God that even through all of this, he would still make a way. And as I continue to read, I begin to sit there and I'm reading all these wonders and I'm being moved and God's presence is so strong. And I sat there and I felt the Holy Spirit just really just, you know, kick me right in the heart and nail me with this question that said, what, what does your story look like? If you were to sit here today and recount all that God has done, what would your story be? If you sat down today and I sat down in front of my two-year-old and told him of all the wonders of how God has moved in my life, what would that song, what would that psalm sound like? And as I sat there, I began to think and I reflected back to a moment as an 11-year-old when I had hurt my shoulder and I came into church and I was just kind of going because my parents were there, but they were praying over people for healing. My dad said, hey, come here. And they began to pray over me, and I felt this warm sensation, and all of a sudden, I had full range of moment, motion, and I experienced God's healing power. And then I remember the moments as I sat in the living room late at night, reading scripture, asking God, do I go into ministry? Do I do this? I don't know what's next, and God providing his provision. When I look back at those moments and I look at when God was faithful, when I wasn't, when I look back when God was good, when he was merciful, when he showed his grace... I mean, said, man, this is the story I want to tell the next generation. This is what I want my children to know about God. And maybe today you feel like, you know, man, that's great, Pastor Jay. But I don't, I've never really had those moments. I don't feel like I really have a story worth telling. Well, that's good because let me encourage you that we all have a story today. And that the greatest story you can share today is the story of the power of grace and God's gift of salvation. Because this is not about any one specific life experience. It doesn't have any person, place, or thing. But this is to anyone today who is in this room, have experienced his life-changing grace. Because let me tell you today, that story is significant. It carries weight. And it is a story worth sharing. Because let me tell you, if you only knew the weight of the sin and the shame that was carried on the cross, then you would know it's a story worth telling. If you only knew the wrath of God that was poured out on your sin, then you would know you have a story that's worth being shared if you only knew the immense power of his grace and the covering of his mercy and the wonders of his love and the miracles and that he has a plan for you and he has a purpose for you and he wants to work in your life then you would know that you have a story worth telling because sometimes it takes really knowing who we are to know how great God is and when we know how great God is we know it's worth telling his story because today if you knew the power of the cross and the power of his blood you would know you have a story and you wouldn't be quiet about it. It would shake you. It would move you to be like, man, I got to tell somebody else about this. Not just for the sake of telling, but they got to experience this. They got to know the God I serve. They got to know how he works. They got to know how he saved me, redeemed me, and how his grace covers me. It's ultimately what we're called to do. As you read through the end of the Gospels, as Jesus goes back to be with the Father, what is his call? What is his um, instruction? It is to go. Probably one of the most famous regards the Great Commission in Matthew. It says, go throughout all the earth, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not something that we should do, but it's something that we are called to do. 
And I think that if we truly knew the weight of the story of grace at work in us, we would not be silent about it. But not only that today, not only must we share what God has done for us, but we must also share who he is. Number two, we must share who God is. In Judges, it says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. How sad is that, that a generation would come that even at a base level, they don't know the stories and the miracles. As great as they were, they didn't know the miracles and the wonders of God, what he had done, what he had brought them through. But even worse, they didn't know who God was. They didn't believe him. Generation after generation, following this apostasy of disbelief, not following God, worshiping false idols. And I think it begs the question, how sad would it be for us at the end of our life to look back and look back at what we've done and to see generation after generation, lineage is lost because we failed to tell the story and model the story of what God has done. We failed to tell of who he is. We failed to tell of his wonders and, we gra- and his grace. How sad would it be to look back at a whole life and all this stuff just to look back and see lineage is lost simply because we didn't tell of the God that we serve. You see, probably one of the biggest challenges today, if we want to look at statistics, great. While only 3% of Gen Z reads their Bible, a whopping, incredible 16% of American Christians read their Bible daily. So we're like, oh, Gen Z, they're done. They're lost. We'll complain about, oh, well, they don't have biblical worldviews. And we'll be like, hey, these institutions are indoctrinating our children. Who's going to teach them the truth? Because if somebody doesn't teach them, then someone will. If we aren't forming who God is and painting the picture of who God is to them through the truth, through the lens of Scripture, then somebody else surely will. But here's the thing. We can't do that. If we don't know scripture, because we're the first to look at generations, I don't know how they believe that. I don't know how they could vote like that. I don't know how they could think that. Well, generations come because they're following generations who are biblically illiterate. You want to teach them how to have a Christian worldview? Then we must look to scripture. To know God, you must know who he is. And the best way to know who God is about his character, his purpose, and his plan is to start with scripture. But even more so, To know God is, I believe you must experience him. Because I think for many of us today, we see this generational gap and many of the questions of why, why are they leaving the church? Why are they doing this? Because for some of us, we're trying to tell a generation about a God we don't even know ourselves. And at best, it's just like a casual friendship. To know God, you must experience him. To experience his grace, his mercy, and his love. Because for too long, we've just passed on, well, hey, well, this is what... My grandma told me about him. This is just, well, I just come to church because my God, well, I respect God. He's a good guy. He desires to do good. But respecting God and knowing God are two very different things. And just respecting God will lead us to generations that do not know God. Because let me tell you, if you've experienced God, then your passion and the energy in which goes into telling the story of what he's done for you, how he's working, how he's moving, when you look at the next generation, you're like, hey, this is the God I serve. This is what he's done for me. This is who he is. I know that he's these things. He's more than just a deity that I read about on a page, but he loves me. He knows me. He has a plan for me. And yet he's done all these miracles and wonders. He created the universe, but he knows me by name. That is the God I serve. But you can't tell that if you don't know him. Our goal is that we're called to share the glorious wonder of God. And that ultimately, as we model that, as we tell that, as we proclaim that, that other generations would see that and they would come to do the same. It's an invitation as we walk out faith, as we experience God and his mercy and his grace, that our life would be an example that invites others to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Not merely just, hey, come, come experience God, come hang out with him. No, but come taste and see that he is good. 
Come experience his healing power. Come experience the miraculous. Come experience his wonders. Come experience his grace. Because I encourage you today, if you truly experienced it, you would surely want to tell it. Lastly, not only do we tell of who God is and what he does, but we must set an example in how we live. Number three, we tell the story by telling how to live. Psalm 78, verse 7, it says, So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. You see, I have a two-year-old. His name's McCoy, and um, we also just had a baby, um, six weeks old. And so in the same month the baby was born, McCoy turned two. And so we had the terrible twos. You had a new baby, and it just heightens the terrible twos. So not only does he have a lot of energy, attitude, and personality, but with that comes a lot of words. Uh, and so recently, we're in the garage, enjoying the nice weather. We're hanging out. McCoy's playing with his big, like, toy Jeep. And, you know, we're just sitting there. Lindsay and I are talking. And uh, all of a sudden, McCoy, like, hops out of his Jeep, and he lands and, like, steps on this, like, dead mosquito that's in the corner of the garage. And as he does that, I hear out of the corner, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, it caught me off guard because I'm like, one, he's never said that. Two, is that bad? Should my two-year-old say that? Should I be concerned? All these things are going through my head. And I look at Lindsay, and I'm like, did you hear that? And I look back at him, and I go, McCoy, what did you just say? And just in the most like blank stare, just standing, just, oh my gosh. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just shook. I'm like, what do I think about this? And in the midst of that, I turn over, I look to Lindsay, and she just goes, well, he learned it from me. <laughs> I say it all the time. Because I surely didn't think my two-year-old created his own vernacular, pieced these three words together in a perfect sentence. Not only that, in the right context to know when to use it. He didn't come up with his own language. He's not that smart, but surely he had heard it somewhere. Because what I realized, all he was doing was modeling the example that had been set by those he was following. He wasn't paving the way for something else. He wasn't doing something different. All he was doing is following what he had seen. Because I think one of the most dangerous places we can be today and across generationally is looking at other generations as if, hey, they got there and they're long gone and they're lost and they don't do this, they don't do that. Why do they think this way? As if it is somehow not affected by the example that was set before them. Because many of us will be the first to say today, well, kids, they just don't go to church. They don't serve. They don't give. They don't want to do this. We'll read all the statistics and do all these things. But what was the example set for them? Good. And my question would be, why would they? Because here's the reality for many in the American church. We come on Sunday, we sit in our seats, we consume rather than contribute, ultimately killing the community that the body of Christ was created to be. We complain when our parking spot isn't just right. We get upset when everything is in our way, when the temperature's not right, they didn't sing my favorite worship song. We're more concerned about lunch plans during the message, but yet we expect a generation to be on fire for God, serving in church and doing all these things. And we wonder, where is the gap? Because here's the reality. If we all have really fooled ourselves to think that in our experience on Sunday will ever replace the influence that we have in the home, the future's not bright. If you think coming to church and a children's pastor is going to instill values that you don't hold valuable at home, it's not going to work. And at most by the grace of God, which that's all it's by anyway. But if I, we'll sit here and we'll complain, we'll come in, we'll sit in our seats, we'll give our 10%, we'll be like, hey, church, go disciple my children. But then we'll be the first ones to call Pastor John on Monday and be like, hey, little Johnny's not, why, doesn't, why isn't he reading his Bible? Well, do you read your Bible? 16%. Well, my kids don't want to come to church. Well, statistically, Americans come to church one in every four Sundays, so why would they? We have questions. We see uncertainty. We have all these things, but many times the first place to start is by reflecting inward of how do we get here? In Joshua chapter 24 we read this passage earlier, but it says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. 
Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. It's a call to serve God. He's saying, you know what? Will you serve those gods? Will you do these things? Okay. But today, choose whom you will serve. And he makes his stand in this declaration saying, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And it sounds great, and many of us proclaim it and we hold it, because one of the most dangerous things we do is when we read scripture, we like to put ourselves, we read scripture with a hero complex, if we're really honest. We put ourselves in the places of Joshua's and heroes and giants of the faith like David. And we're like, you know what? I'm going to tell the story. We're going to do this. And then generations are going to be saved. Or, you know, I'm David. I'm going to come out. I'm going to get the rocks and I'm going to slay a giant. Maybe. Maybe God will work and you'll slay all the giants in your life. But it's not because of anything you did, because reality is in these stories, we're not the Joshua's, we're the rebellious generations. We're not the David, we're the other scared soldiers running back to the tents. We take ourselves, we put ourselves in the position of these Christ-like figures throughout Scripture that even through their righteousness and gracious couldn't redeem a people. But for some reason, we think that if I do this, if I do all these things, if I just get everything right, then I will save people, I will save a generation. When in reality, it's the only reason we do all these things. We tell stories. We model what God has done. We live out these spiritual disciplines. We follow God. Not that so we can save people because we can't save anyone. It's only through God's grace. But through our example and through our model, we invite them on a journey and we point them on a path to experience that grace. That today we would have the boldness to say to generations to come to follow me as I follow Christ. To imitate me as I imitate him. To see his wonders and his glories. These are the things I've experienced in my life. So come, if you want to follow Christ, follow me. I don't have the answers. I may not have it all perfect. I cannot save you, but I know the one who can. You see the beauty of this whole story and the whole picture of the New Testament. When you look at it, you see this big picture of God's redemptive plan. That even through all the miraculousness and all this purpose... He had wonders and miracles, but followed by rebellion after rebellion and disbelief and apostasy, generation after generation, even after the most righteous and the men that found the most favor with God, it still wasn't enough. Because then eventually, they would fall under the rule of King David, and then God would promise an heir to the throne of David. And his name would be Jesus, and he would come, and he would live a perfect life. He would know no sin. He would go to the cross being the perfect sacrifice, paying the price for you and for me so that we may experience his grace. That's the story. God's redemptive plan and God's grace to redeem his creation, this purpose then has made a way for you and I now. So when we tell the story today, may it be a boldness of a God who loves us, who has a purpose, who has a plan for us. May we live out in an example that says, hey, come follow me. Let me show you to our grace. Let me show you how to experience grace. Let me show you to experience his power and his mercy because for it is only by grace through which we can be saved. My prayer today is that in our hearts we leave knowing that if it was not by grace, we can tell the greatest stories. We can live the greatest life. We can be great people. But if not by the grace of God, we're saved by grace through faith. Without his grace, it wouldn't be possible. So point people to grace. Tell the story of grace. In closing, I want to give you three really, really practical things. You may be asking today, oh, Pastor Jay, that sounds great. I've got to live good. I've got to tell the story good, all these things. But what are some practical ways that I can tell the story, that I can tell of God's goodness, I can tell of his faithfulness, and practice these things with my family? And this isn't limited to your family, and your children, you can practice this with extended family at holiday gatherings. I highly encourage you to do that. You can practice this with friends um, at the dinner table. But number one is regularly talk about how God is moving and speaking. 
We should make it more, it should not be awkward to talk about God, how he's doing, what he's moving, how he's speaking in the life of your family, in the life of your church at the dinner table. Your children should be comfortable talking about, man, this is what God's doing in my life. This is how he's speaking to me. It should be a normal practice. When we're at family gatherings, it should be normal to sit down with the loved one and be like, hey, what is God doing in your life? What is he doing in your local church? Our minds and our thoughts should be focused on the things of God, and the best way to do that is to practice that in a very practical way. Because reality is, if we aren't doing it with the ones we love, we sure aren't doing it with people we don't know. Number two, regularly talk about who God is and what he has done. You should spend time with family, especially with children, talking about, hey, this is what God's done in our family. This is how he's been faithful. This is when we've seen him move in miraculous ways. This is how I've experienced this. This should be something that is regularly talked about. It should not be rare. It should not be abnormal. But we should have a generation that is used to talking about the things of God. Because when we talk about it, it begins to excite us. We should have a, you want a generation excited about the things of God, then consistently talk about what God is doing and how he's moving. Because I'm telling you, he's moving in wonderful, powerful, and miraculous ways. Many times the issue is we just aren't talking about it and we aren't aware of it enough. So talk about it. Tell about it. And then lastly, regularly practice spiritual disciplines as a family. Read scripture. Pray together. Take communion together. Fast together. You can fast outside of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. You can take communion outside of Sunday morning. And we can practice that as a family. We can show our children what it looks like to walk a spiritual walk, to practice these disciplines, to serve. A practical way to serve, hey, just make your neighbor dinner and just take them dinner. Say, hey, guys, we love you. You can eat it today or warm it up later, but we just love you and we just want to serve you. Show the generation what it looks like to serve. Show them what it looks like to be generous because it's not these disciplines, it's not these practices that are going to save us. But the power in them are is that we follow these things as we live like Jesus lived and we do the things Jesus did. It leads us to a place where we experience the end of ourself because it's at the end of ourself when we encounter the power of God's grace. So today, our hope is that we lead the generation on the pathway to encountering the powerful and miraculous grace of God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Thank you so much today for tuning in and checking out the message. We hope you were encouraged. And today, if you'd like to make a decision to become a Christ follower, please contact us. You can do that by simply clicking the link in the description below. And today, if you'd like more information about Northwest Church or you would like to plan a visit to come visit us in person, you can simply do that by going to northwestchurch.tv. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to connect with you.